Uh, hi, I'm uh, Fessel. This, by the way, this is an autonomous vehicle from General Motors uh, from the 1950s. That's a concept. Uh, and then those vehicles are now coming back again. So let me sort of switch this. To... So I actually uh, work uh, in the auto industry. I've been working for a long time, and I get to write uh, functional code on a daily basis and get paid for it, but I can't write production code. So well, I'm basically writing uh, mostly F Sharp and Scala for, for analytics. So uh, this is some of my, I'm also pursuing PhD at Wayne State. This is some of my work uh, in research work. So I'll start with some background and motivation, how and why did I come up with this thing. Uh, we'll briefly revisit state machines just so we can talk about this idea of functional state machines and then actually how do you make these things you know, handle uh, uh, noisy data or probabilistic patterns or stochastic patterns uh, and then you know how do you actually make them trainable and once they're trainable how do you actually go about training them with the help of some evolutionary computing algorithm some search based algorithm and my actually PhD work will, is on this something called cultural algorithm framework uh, that's my main topic if I have time I'll talk about that or you can talk to me about it afterwards um, so it's uh, these three trends, uh, you can probably observe them fairly easily. So what's happening is that automakers, uh, you know, their systems are becoming more complex. Uh, and so they're looking at uh, natural user interface technologies to reduce driver distraction, right? So they, they want the driver to keep their eyes on the road. So voice recognition is there, but it's, you know, it's not really working out well. So you're starting to see now gesture control um, in cars. And at the same time, Google and uh, Apple, they're trying to take over the dash through products such as Android Auto and Apple, Apple Car. And then there's this whole uh, wearable computing revolution happening. So, so given all of that, you know, it's a valid question to ask, OK, can I take something like a wearable device, like a smartwatch, and use that for gesture control of an automotive uh, system, maybe through you know, App Android or Apple Car? And so this is a research question I set out to answer. You know, you know, you, this random question pops into your head, and you're compelled to answer it. You know, we saw that earlier. So uh, I did some research and an implementation around that. Uh, and this talk is really about the learnings from that. And uh, as far as the original research question goes, you know, what I concluded was, yes, it seems feasible. You know, there's something there that can work, but it requires more refinement and testing. Okay, so this is the actual research implementation. I built an app that runs on a, a smartwatch and Android. Uh, it's written in F Sharp, used the Xamarin toolkit. Uh, it's, uh, and it recognizes a simple gesture vocabulary that you see down below in order to drive this sort of mock uh, menu hierarchy that you see on the right. Um, now, if you look at gesture recognition, it's, it's nothing more than recognizing patterns in noisy data, you know, so. Uh, sensors are inherently noisy, you know, human limb movements, they're not precise, and then you, know, you have the vehicle motion in, in our case to contend with, so it's a very noisy data environment. But there are many techniques that are available, so, you know, most commonly used one is hidden Markov models, but there's many others, and I use sort of plain old uh, uh, finite state machines. Uh, and the thing about finite state machines is that they're, they're, you know, they're computationally efficient, so they're suitable for these low power, these wearable computer devices. However, you can, there's some problems. So you can run into the state space explosion you know, in some cases. And uh, you know, the textbook doesn't tell you how to handle probabilistic patterns with these things. So my talk is really about you know, how do you address some of these minus points and still make them useful for pattern rec or gesture recognition. So let's quickly look at uh, state machines. Uh, assume you know, uh, you know, there's some sequence of characters being generated, and you want to recognize this particular pattern. So you might build a state machine that looks like this here in the start state. You know, it's looking at characters as, as events. If it doesn't see an A, it just transitions back. If it sees an A, it goes to this state. Uh, you know, and it sees another A, it goes to this state, and so forth. Right? Something very simple, basic. We all learned in uh, computer science 101. I'm abstracting away, error handling, how would you apply that in a streaming fashion? But at the core, you'd build something like this. So given that sort of idea, let's talk about functional state machines. And you probably have guessed the idea is to take you know, a finite state machine and express that using functional code. And the transformation actually is, is fairly straightforward. So your state just become functions. 
uh, event handling becomes pattern matching and transitioning just becomes returning a, a function. Okay, so let's take a look at that more concretely. Hopefully it's visible. So up here is our, our, our uh, graphical representation and this is uh, you know, the functional code, uh, functional representation, functional state machine. And uh, this is uh, F-sharp code, but it could be some ML derivative. And I think this concept will work in Haskell as well, in uh, many other languages. So uh, the way it works is that, you know, the start, the, the, first of all, the, the number of nodes you see here is the same as these bold red words. So these are the states or the function states, if you will. So start here is basically a function, it's like any other function, but this function keyword is telling the compiler that you know, the body of this function is a bunch of pattern match clauses. Right, so, and, and then the start function takes an implicit argument of type character because I'm using a literal in this pattern match. So this is the pattern match clause, it starts with this vertical bar, then you have a pattern, then you have an arrow, and then some action you take. So, so assume that something will call the start function right, with a character, and assume it happens to be an A. And then we'll perform this action, which is essentially what we're doing is we are transitioning uh, to this A1 function state, but we're wrapping it in this M sort of recursive type. So we need this recursive type for these types to line up. But semantically, we're just returning a, a, a function wrapped in this you know, M wrapper. And then whatever call start will then get this M wrapper, it'll extract the function out of it, call it again with the next character, you know, and this whole process will continue. So that's how you will execute this uh, statement sheet. Okay, so let's make our problem a little bit more complex. So assume that instead of this simple pattern, we now want to recognize three A's and three B's but they can be in any order, right? So the order, but they have to be exactly three A's and three B's. So one question you can ask is, okay, well, you know, I've got this six character pattern, you know, maybe I can use six states plus minus a few more and wire up the transition so we can recognize this pattern. But it turns out that that's not the case and you actually need an exponential uh, number of states because you have to deal with the permutations. So this is known as a, this, the state space explosion a problem, or at least some version of that. And so now the question is, can we do better with this idea of functional state machines? So let's take a quick look at that. So this is, uh, hopefully everybody can see this. Uh, this is that code for functional state machines that recognizes three A's and three B's. Right off the bat, you see, okay, I don't need an exponential number of states. There's only five set of states, or function states. But that, that's a bit of a lie, so let's go into it and see what's going on. So. So what happens is that, uh, you know, the, in the start phase, let's assume this function gets called, you know, with this, with this A uh, character. So now it'll try to transition into this FAB function state. But this FAB doesn't look like ordinary function state because it doesn't take a character as an argument and return this M type. So its type signature doesn't really match. But we're, what we're doing here is we're using partial applications, right? So we're saying, okay, we're gonna just return this function partially applied and then we get, get back a function that matches the type signature. So assume that, you know, uh, that now we're here, uh, this function is partially applied, gets called again, this time it sees another A. And this is now bound to one and this is bound to zero. And so uh, what'll happen, it'll, it'll try to match this, this pattern but there's a when condition here, so this will not succeed because count A is one, so this will not succeed. It'll go down to the next uh, pattern match clause, which will succeed, and here what we're doing is we're transitioning back to this function state, but we're incrementing the count. So you can probably see what's, what's going on here is that, you know, from a, a computer science point of view, the total number of state is the states is still probably the same as before. But uh, from a human trying to model a pattern recognition system, we can use abstraction and we can divide up this state uh, into this high level sort of semantic states and shove this low level state information as partially applied arguments, right? So we can uh, basically what, if you try to build a, like a traditional state machine, find a state machine to recognize uh, this pattern, it'll be very unwieldy. But here, you know, we're able to tackle that problem, a more complex pattern recognition problem and still, you know, keep it uh, essentially uh, tractable and manageable. So this was kind of the key, uh, one of the key insights is that, you know, if you try to model your state machine as functional state machines, then you can take advantage of uh, partial application 
you can, in effect, achieve a state space compression, and then you can also handle more complex patterns more easily. Okay, so let's talk about pattern recognition. Just you will you, you use this code later, so I just want to quickly describe what's going on. So in F# -sharp, ML, or Camel, I think you can write, they have a record structure that look like this. So this is a record structure. Say there's uh, you know these sensors in your system are are generating sensor data, and you're mapping them into instances of this record. So you have your sensor type, its timestamp, the X, Y, Z values. <laughs> So assume that these instances of these records are coming over and your functional state machines and their events for your state machines. And then you can do pattern matching that, you know, very flexible pattern matching, like I think uh, with the talk earlier, talk about pattern matching. So you would give a record like this, you can match to a literal to part of the record and extract values from the rest of the record. So you can be very flexible about how you, hand, you know, do your pattern matching. Uh, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. This is actually actual code from my Android watch. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how do you actually now handle uh, noisy data or stochastic patterns. So uh, assume that you know you have your uh, your records as events coming in, and you want to recognize a swipe gesture. So this is a side to side movement of your hand. So your watch face is kind of vertical to the ground, and this, uh, the z-axis relative to the watch face is parallel to the ground. So let's say you're mainly interested in the z acceleration component. So you might build a, uh, you know, a, a state machine, that a partial version of it that looks like this. In the start, you know, you're, you're just looking at linear acceleration events, and you're extracting the z value out of it. And then you're comparing it to some uh, threshold, like five meters per second square. And then you say, okay, well, if that threshold gets exceeded, I'm possibly, you know, in a swing phase. But I'm, I'm not sure yet, you know, but I'm, maybe I am. So what you would do is you'll say, okay, I'm going to transition over to a new function state, uh, and I'm going to pass in some existing z value and the number of times I've seen it. And while I'm in this function state, I'm continuing to sort of listen to the linear acceleration event. So I'm getting more linear acceleration events. Uh, and extracting the z value. What I'm doing here is just computing the average z value, right? So, um, so these events come in very fast, like uh, you know, uh, where the sensor is feeding a data very, very fast. So in a short time, you have a lot of these events. So here you can say, okay, well, uh, you know, so you, you basically capture these events, you update your average z acceleration, and you transition back, and you keep doing that until you know you have some count, and then you say, okay, well, now I have enough data to know exactly what's going on. Am I in, I'm really in the swing phase, or the initial threshold was exceeded due to some, some random event, and then you can sort of then go switch over to the next state and actually you know, make a determination. So you're able to handle sort of probabilistic patterns or you know, this uncertain situations by doing, essentially, again, using partial application but this time with, with aggregation, right? So and your aggregation could be you know, simple averages, could be min-max ranges, could be some statistical computation. You know, it all depends. OK, so now let's talk about how actually you make these things trainable. So you're now able to handle sort of noisy data. It's, you know, it, it's more involved than what I showed, but you know, the conceptually, this is what you would do. So what happens is that, especially if you're dealing with real-valued sensor data, right? So it's your functional state machines will be kind of little littered with these uh, constants, right? What is the right value for this threshold? Is it 5.0 meters per second squared? Is it 6.1? You know, you have really no idea as a human. So as a human, sort of modeling the high-level uh, abstract sort of pattern recognition system, you have a good idea what are the states, what are the transitions. But really, these values are very pesky and, you know, you have no idea what they are. So what you can do is then say, okay, well, what I'm going to do is I can take all of these values, put them in one big structure, uh, you know, like a record structure, and then make that the first argument of all my function states, right? So you basically use a partial application again, and this time uh, you, you can now, what you can do is this is still all pure functions. Uh, you can do is you can sort of instantiate your state machine with this configuration, you pass in, uh, and then you use values from that configuration in your, tra in your transition decisions. And now you can substitute your know, new values. So you can say, OK, well, I'm going to try. As a human, I can try out new values and see how they work. So it's because your state machines are now parameterized. 
But the problem is that that's a very tedious work, right? For a human, that's very tedious work. So why not let the machine deal with it? Let you know, use machine, some kind of machine optimi optimization. So uh, we'll take a look at that in, in, a, in a minute or two. So I just want to point out that here again, we're using our one trick pony of partial application, but we're now combining with uh, parameterization to essentially make our state machines uh, in a, in a trainable. And you can take this idea of partial application you, you know, even further, so you can partially apply state machines when, with another state machine, so you can organize your pattern recognition system as a hierarchy. hierarchy. You can support modularization or call return semantics. You can do parallel execution. And separately, you know, I've used this approach uh, with uh, reactive extensions. So reactive extensions is a kind of a stream uh, processing framework. Uh, so it's a very nice way of composing stream processing, but sometimes you have to write new operators, right? So when you have to write new operators, this approach came very handy to write those operators very compactly. And so I've used it with Apache Storm. Uh, and in the future, you know, uh, and yeah, Google is going to come up with this new Android uh, system. It's a pared down Android system uh, that runs for IoT devices. And so you can use something like that for, for those systems because a lot of the systems will be doing this you know, event handling uh, kind of work. Okay, so I mean, this is just a summary. I'm gonna skip that. Uh, I'm gonna talk about you know, how do you actually go about training something like this, right? So first of all, I just wanna show you this is actual uh, uh, the parameter configuration from my watch, sort of just a recognition app. So, you know, no human will come up with a number like this. So, so machine learned. Okay, so in, in training these things, there's basically, the process is like this. You have four basic steps. So the first thing you want to do is get your training data that you'll use for machine learning. Right, so if you're doing a gesture recognition system, so you will actually perform the gesture. So you'll perform the swipe gesture 10 times and record the raw sensor output and label that, you know, this is the swipe, and you'll do that for all your other gestures. Then you can say, analyze that, uh, that flow of uh, sensor information and figure out, you know, abstractly what is the pattern there that you, that, you know, that is the gesture, and you create your sort of functional state machines, your states and transitions, and, and you, um, you know, put placeholders for your, these parameter values, these, these low-level values that you use in your transition decisions. And, uh, and then what you do is you say, okay, well, I'm gonna now create an, uh, formulate an optimization problem. Uh, you know, that involves these parameter values. Uh, this is a, you know, this is a fair amount of work and, uh, you know, I don't have time in this talk, but it's, it's a talk in, if, uh, in of itself. But essentially, you know, you involve these parameter values somehow, you have kind of a fitness function and, and then you're trying to optimize that fit fitness function. And then you solve that optimization problem using some uh, search-based algorithms, stochastic search, like genetic algorithm, particle swarm. As I said, I, I use something called cultural algorithms framework. That's the work I'm doing. So essentially, what this algorithm will do is we'll basically try, try out different values of these parameters. We'll create these functional, parameterized functional state machines. We'll run them over to your training data to see, okay, are you recognizing all the gestures you should recognize? Are you missing any gestures? Are you recognizing any spurious gestures? So this algorithm, you know, based on how you define your optimization problem, will tighten all these parameters, you know, so you have good performance on your, you know, this functional state machine. Uh, and so this is actually um, the, the optimization formulation for my, for my, for my uh, gesture recognition. App. I won't go through it, it's something there for reference, you can look at it later. I just want to point out that, you know, I started out with, you know, uh, so there's this function, fitness function that creates this score, uh, and the maximum score is 120, so I plugged in sort of best guess values and my score was 1 point, minus 1.5. Then I ran the optimization and, you know, it, it really got down to 92.5, so it shows you that it was quite effective, so I got 77% gesture recognition efficiency. Okay, so I'm gonna just briefly summarize what I talked about. So the main idea here is that, you know, uh, you can express finite state machines very, very naturally in functional code. Uh, and then you can then take advantage of partial application to handle more complex patterns, have, handle probabilistic patterns, you know. You can then train these uh, state machines using some kind of training system we just saw. 
And this is kind of the core part here is that this is sort of, you're, you're using a blended intelligence. So you're using the human's ability to think abstractly, uh, and then you're using the machine's ability to optimize. To at the end of the day, you get a more computationally efficient system at runtime, compared to something like hidden markup models or neural nets or something like that. You know, this is a, this is a sort of a win here. And the, so there's a paper I submitted to the IEEE conference on you know, blended intelligence and swarm intelligence. So it's going to be published, uh, like the conference uh, in September, so hopefully it'll be published uh, soon after that. Okay, how are we doing for time? Okay, so uh, I'll open up the floor to questions, or if you want to look, look at cultural algorithms framework, we can do that also. So, all right, so you're using functions to sort of re like compress the state space representation, right? That's basically what you're trying to do. Did you consider any other sort of like intermediate data structures before you just sort of went, okay, let's go functions? Uh, well, I think that the idea was how do you model these things very effectively as a human, right? So, you, you, so I think functions were a very natural way of modeling these things. And the pattern matching functions and returning another function as transition, it seemed very natural to me. I'm yeah. sure that, I mean, if you look at the literature, there are a lot of other approaches that solve the same kind of problem, but in different ways. Yeah. I think it was a natural fit uh, using a functional programming language. Uh, you can very directly model your state machines, and you can manage the complexity uh, through partial application. Right, which is, which is great, but like, you know, it's an opaque way of modeling your data, which means that it's going to be a pain to actually sort of look at you know, the state of your system when you're trying to, you know, you know what I mean? Uh, so like, you know, there might be a way to, for example, like symbolically re represent the function as opposed to just using a function. Have you thought about that at all or no? No, I have okay. not. Maybe you can talk later yeah. and okay. get your ideas. Okay. Okay, thank you.